Good evening. As we gather this evening, we have a lot on our minds. The ongoing conflict in Europe that involves so many people, the threat of spreading hate and violence. We also know that in times like these, there's opportunity for grace. And so we remember in our prayers those who are making decisions as well as those who follow the Lord. We pray for wisdom to face the challenges that such circumstances bring to bear. We also remember the, way the, the ways that COVID has affected so many. And while it seems to be shrinking, still so many lives have been marked by this virus. Tonight begins Lent, a prolonged season of reflection that starts with the encouragement to consider our own mortality, as well as the effects of our choices, the impact of circumstances and events that are beyond our control. In times like this, it's important and good to reach toward God, to pour out our hearts, to trust the Lord for guidance, comfort, strength, so let's look now to the Lord who loves, who forgives, who calls us to walk in the light. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty and gracious God, praise be to your holy name. As we come together this evening, Lord, our hearts and minds go in several directions. And we pray that you would be at work around our world and here closer to home. We thank you that you're with us here this evening. And as we worship together, as we reflect on what you have done, on where we stand, Lord, would you bring your spirit to guide us in this and draw us closer to you. This we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Our scripture this evening comes from 1 John. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, John says. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Oh. 
Sue and I were at dinner last night with a friend who's a teacher, and she said she was polling her students to ask them if any of them knew what Lent was. Very few had heard of it. She said, well, what about today, Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras? Well, that's a party day, they said. Yeah, but why, she asked. Nobody could say, other than who needs an, a reason for a party, right? So. It's actually little wonder that Lent is not well known or even practiced. I mean, Lent asks us to slow down and take stock. Activities which are not much valued when so much is going on and we need to keep checking, keep moving. We do not often pause to give careful thought to our ways. To spend moments like this in reflection, though, has real value. As we are brought close to the symbols of dust and ashes, we consider our own mortality. When we make the sign of a cross, we ponder the place of God's grace in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Lent nudges us to think about how we've organized priorities, where we've placed our allegiance, what our relationship with God is like. This also makes it a good time to think about sin, something else we would just as soon avoid. You hear about sin in church and in the Bible. Indeed, indeed, some would say that sin is all or most of what the Bible and church want to talk about. For some, God is all about sin. In one hand, he holds a list, a list that begins with, thou shalt not and in the other, a lightning bolt to smite all who sin. It's true that the Bible has a fair bit to say about sin. The first mention is all the way back in Genesis, in chapter 4, as we hear about Cain, the one who murdered his brother. But before that happens, God is talking to Cain. Cain has grown angry, and the Lord is warning him and saying that sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. In this text, the first time sin is mentioned, sin is a force. It's a power that overwhelms. And we see how Cain gives into it, as Adam and Eve had before him, and then we read that sin infects all of humanity. After Adam, scripture says, all are affected by sin. We are born into a realm where sin dominates. Here, God is not much considered or not considered carefully. Little more attention is given to God than just to dismiss or to resist or to mock him. When the Bible talks about sin as a realm, it uses words like darkness and captivity and death. A sin has to do with behavior, of course. That's the one that's really familiar to us. And we hear plenty about that, about lying and cheating and stealing. All of this is called sin. It's a problem. And scripture pushes back hard against it, aware of the damage that sin does. It disrupts, it disfigures, it affects body, mind, 
heart psyche. The writers of scripture insist that sin is real and that it is also lamentable. The good news announced in these pages, though, is that there's an alternative made possible by God's grace. We hear that story, which centers on Jesus, who came to live on this earth, to go to the cross and rise from the grave. In doing this, Jesus opens the way into a different realm where goodness, beauty, life prevail. In this realm, Jesus is Lord, and people, with God's help, take on a set of values, aims, and commitments that promote mutual flourishing rather than disruption. Jesus invites people to follow him into this realm. Many have, many do, many will. But the pull of sin is still strong. We were raised in that world. We learned its lessons well. And so we find ourselves, even after saying yes to Jesus, and more often than we would like or perhaps care to admit, we find ourselves slipping back into the old ways. When that happens, what do we do? Do we give up? No. We're called to turn back, to refocus, to acknowledge the slippage, to do what we can to fix the problems we've caused, to recommit to following the Lord. Ash Wednesday helps us with this by encouraging us to confess the ways that we've slipped, wandered, turned away from God, in these moments of reflection, we can, with God's help, examine our hearts, confess our sins, say yes to the Lord once more. We remember that in following Jesus, we have entered a new way of living. We keep trusting the Lord to walk with us as we move along this new path. And so we come now to this time of confession. And before we pray together, we're going to take a quiet moment to reflect, to allow the Lord to examine our hearts and see what lies there. Let's pray. And let us pray together. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may love you and magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Father Almighty, Christ.
Christ, Redeemer, have mercy on us. Spirit, Advocate, have mercy on us. Loving God, three in one. Bring us your peace. We call the laying on of ashes an imposition. And often we think of impositions as being unwelcome. The neighbor who is an imposition, an interruption. Here we think of something that we take on willingly and receive a tangible sign that speaks to ourselves as well as others to say, my intent is to follow Jesus, to let go of life on my own terms, of life under the dominion of sin. Instead, I want to walk the road Jesus marks out, I want to lean towards the Lord who loves me, who by grace has saved me.
this feels like such a holy moment. I was not raised in a tradition where this was practiced. But I am so thankful to be part of one now. And to be part of a church where this is taken seriously. And it's a, it's a deep privilege for me to take part in this service to, this evening. So thank you. And I thank the Lord for what he's done in my life and for what he's doing in the lives of so many who are part of this church. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, not treating us as our sins deserve or repaying us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Amen. 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 Thanks be to God. Please stand. <clears throat> have been seeing in these past days a series of blue and yellow flags. They show up on social media as badges. Buildings are lit up with these colors. People carry these flags around or put them in important places because they want to show solidarity. They want to indicate their sympathies. They want to say, I'm with them. The cross that we bear, whether as a mark on our bodies or impressed into our hearts, this is a way of indicating our allegiance, of saying, I'm with him. Amen. This concludes our service. <laughs>